that we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Let us praise the living God together.
morning, church. Good morning. A warm summer welcome to one and all. Uh, the heart of our church is summed up in these words. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And so following the service today, we would love for you all to join us downstairs in the parish hall, where you will find something to nibble, something to sip, but always someone to talk to. And if you are a visitor or you have a prayer request, please enter the information on the welcome card that you will find in the pew in front of you and place it in one of our three collection boxes throughout the sanctuary. Our programs for children, youth, and adults will resume in September, and our glorious chancel choir will also return at that time. If you would like to bring flowers from your garden or a work of art for an altar, please call Connie Meese. Her number is in the order of worship. And at this time, we would like everyone who is able to stand to please stand and greet those around you. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves and go to a quiet place to get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. In the reading of these words, may we hear the word of the Lord. Good morning. In keeping with our theme today, our pastoral theme of Jesus as Good Shepherd, I've chosen two versions of the 23rd Psalm to sing for you today. And later on, you'll hear one I think some of you might find familiar. This one that we're going to do now is actually uh, something I picked up in my years singing in Jewish synagogues it is one of the most lovely versions of the 23rd Psalm I've ever heard, but I'm singing it in the original Hebrew. You can probably pick up the, the atmosphere of Jesus and the, the grass and the running brooks and the safety he provides for us, despite the language. <laughs>
Thank you, Craig. Thank you, people. Uh, the lowest grade I ever made in my entire life was in Hebrew. I passed, but not by much. You know, if you could have sung all my lessons to me, April, I think I would have done that. Maybe I'll get a redo. So today in our prayers, we're going to remember the Keese and Farrell families who lost young people in their lives uh, one year ago today, as well as the Maglio family. Their daughter survived the crash, uh, but may never fully recover. So, let us read responsibly our call to prayer. We are created in the image of God. We walk in the presence of God. We live surrounded by the love of God. In the power of the Spirit, let us pray to God. Good Shepherd. Teach us to follow you, to care for all that are close to us, to protect those who are threatened, to welcome those who are rejected, to forgive those who are burdened by guilt, to heal those who are broken and sick, to share with those who have little or nothing. Good Shepherd, teach us to follow you, to spread compassion, to those who are far away, to speak for those who are voiceless, to defend those who are oppressed and abused, to work for justice for those who are exploited, to make peace for those who suffer violence, to take the time to recognize our connectedness and to love as you have loved us. Oh God, we know there are many people in need this day, in this sanctuary, in our church, in our country, in our nation, all over the world, God. So we ask that all of those who have needs will have those needs met by people of love and compassion. Oh God, we say a special prayer today for the Keys and Carol families. Those of us who have not been through a tragedy like that can't really understand the pain that they experience and that they still experience. So give them comfort and peace on this day. And oh God, we pray for Marie Matthew. We know that her life may never be the same. And so we pray for her and we pray for her family as they seek to care for her in the best ways they can find. So, Good Shepherd, teach us to follow you and to be faithful to calling you and the calling you gave us, gave us all to be shepherds to one another in your name. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
So today we're doing everything from this side of the chancel uh, because Lori and Jacob are on vacation and we're down to using just one phone. <laughs> now, we're going on vacation next weekend, our family is, and, and we're going up north to Canada. Makes sense, right? Hot, et cetera, et cetera. Lori and Jacob went down to Tennessee and Georgia. There have been record-breaking temperatures of 100 and over. Uh, no one can remember ever being this hot for this long. So I'm not saying they made a bad choice going down south. It would be nice, cool, and collected in Canada next week. Back in July 2018, we took a vacation and had a wonderful trip to England and Wales. A highlight was the Welsh countryside, including its pastures and streams and small mountains. I wish that I could say that we saw green pastures, as in the native need to lie down in green pastures. Unfortunately, there were no green pastures, since they had had a lack of rain for weeks. All of the green grass had turned brown, and while it wasn't good for the sheep or those who take care of them, for tourists, the lack of rain was really kind of nice. Before leaving for Britain, we, we packed our rain jackets and our umbrellas, and then all ready for the usual damp British weather. And it turns out, out of being there for two weeks, I only needed my rain jacket once, and that was for cool temps and scattered showers. We decided to rent a car while we were there. Having always driven on the right side of the road, it was difficult driving on the wrong side of the road, otherwise known as the left side. And as we drove down the narrow country lanes, we saw sheep scattered amidst the pastures that were separated by these beautiful ancient stone walls. As we rounded a tight curve, I glanced at the side of the road and I saw a dead sheep, which appeared to have collided with a car or a truck. Less than a mile later, I saw another sheep, this time on the right side. Shortly after, I saw random sheep grazing along the roadside on the wrong side of the fence. And I wonder out loud, where is the shepherd? How did the sheep escape their pasture? Naturally, I thought of the wandering Welsh sheep when I read the line in today's text where Jesus looks at a crowd of people and, quote, has compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are vulnerable. They wander unknowingly away from the safety of the flock, looking for the grass that isn't always greener on the other side. They need a faithful shepherd who has their best interests at heart. Sheep need a shepherd to lead them to the green pastures and still waters, as described in the 23rd Psalm, that of course starts with a wonderful line, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. The stories and imagery of shepherds and sheep can be traced throughout the entire Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. In Genesis, we find out in the early chapters that Abel offered God a lamb without blemish. And when God mentions the obvious to Abel's brother, Cain, a farmer, Cain is so jealous that he kills his brother, the shepherd. I guess that means that he left his brother's shepherd, no, his brother's sheep without a shepherd. We also find shepherd imagery in the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which referring to Christ says, worthy is the lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. In between 
Genesis, and Revelation. The Bible mentions sheep and shepherds time and again. In the Hebrew Bible, we find these words from the book of Ezekiel. I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered. Psalm 100 says, We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. Isaiah reminds us that sheep are prone to wander, saying, All we like sheep have gone astray. Zechariah says it this way, People wander like sheep. They are afflicted for the lack of a sheep. And then in Isaiah 40, these wonderful words, God will tend the flock like a shepherd. God will gather the lambs in his arms. God will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are without them. The New Testament as well has plenty to say about shepherds and sheep. From the shepherds who showed up in Bethlehem to praise the new, the new newly born Jesus, to Jesus' parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to go in search of and eventually find the one sheep that has gone astray. I've done sermons on that, and from a capitalist perspective, I don't understand why you would abandon 99 sheep to go find one sheep. But uh, from a heavenly perspective, it makes sense. And then there's this in the Gospel of John. Jesus says of himself, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and they know me. First Peter explains that people were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd. And the shepherd is called the overseer of our souls. And I love these words in the book of Revelation. The Lamb is in the midst of the throne and will be their shepherd, will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And finally, the book of Matthew, which echoes Mark, when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion to them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. It's worth noting that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and King David all worked as shepherds at one time or another. These were domestic animals that people living in the Middle East at that time were quite familiar with. And while shepherds in the Bible are usually shown in a favorable light, sheep are usually seen as needy creatures who could never make it on their own. Why? First, while sheep might be known for their warm wool, they are never praised for their IQ. In short, sheep are not the smartest animals in the past. More often than not, sheep blindly follow the sheep ahead of them, sometimes with perilous results. When I was growing up, my parents used to ask me, if such and such jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge, would you? Well, at that point, I had never seen the Brooklyn Bridge. For all I knew, it was five feet above the water. So I said, I might. Such logic and bridge jumping is entirely lost on sheep. They are documented to blindly follow the lead sheep over the side of a cliff. Case in point, in a piece from 2013, Hundreds of sheep followed their leading sheep off a cliff in eastern Turkey, plunging to their deaths, while shepherds looked on in dismay. 400 sheep fell 15 meters to their death in the ravine. However, the next thousand sheep that fell on top of them fell on something like a woolly pillow, and they were okay. 
So one she wanders off a cliff, and 1,500 follow, and yet there are those who survive it for landing on a nice, soft, woolly bed. It is completely absurd and tells us the fact about sheep and a reason that sheep desperately need a shepherd. They are not what you call independent thinkers. Not only do they blindly follow the sheep ahead of them, but they are utterly defenseless. They are often doomed when faced with danger because they are not equipped for fight or flight. They have neither sharp claws nor fierce teeth with which to protect themselves. And to make matters worse, sheep are neither fast nor agile and can be easily overtaken by predators. So how does a sheep respond when faced with danger? I've read that it flocks, for instance, if a bear approaches, and the flock will run around in circles, panicking, with all of the sheep hoping that the bear will just get somebody else. So why in the Bible are people so frequently compared to sheep? It doesn't sound like a compliment, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's an insult. As a metaphor, I think it reflects humanity's relationship with God. What does it mean in today's text when it says Jesus looks at the people who have come to hear him and thinks they look like sheep without a shepherd? His immediate response is to begin teaching them to impart God's wisdom. What did he see in the first century crowd? And what would he see in our 21st century crowd? My guess is essentially the same because the human condition has not changed much in the last 20 centuries. In a crowd then, as now, Jesus sees people who are beaten down by life. Maybe someone they love suffers from a disease for which there is no cure. Maybe they lost a loved one in an accident. Maybe they lost their job and had no money for rent. Maybe their adult child is choosing the wrong path. Maybe their mother is in a nursing home. Maybe their father has lost her. Maybe they are depressed and feel they have nowhere to turn. And the list goes on and on and on. Life is like that. And yet there was something then, as there is now, about the good shepherd that makes life worth living. What does Jesus the good shepherd offer to those who have incurable diseases, to those who are experiencing seemingly unsolvable problems, he offers himself. He offers the embodiment of love in flesh and bones as fragile and frail as ours. Through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we learn that while none of us are spared suffering or unimaginable loss, None of us are so far gone that we are beyond the reach of God's tender grasp. Everything that happens on this side of eternity is finite and mortal. But what happens on the other side of eternity is infinite and immortal. It's like the verse I read earlier from Revelation, where God wipes away every tear. Perhaps it was something like this that Jesus told those who looked like sheep without a shepherd on that day long ago. When we boil down all the teachings of Christ, we come to one word, 
And of course, that word is love. In the New Testament, we read that God is love. So in one sense, we can substitute the word love for the word God. Someone did this with the 23rd Psalm, and I will leave you with this today. It says, Love is my shepherd, I shall not want. Love makes me lie down in green pastures. Love leads me beside the still waters. Love restores my soul. Lord leads me in paths of righteousness. For God's name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for love is with me. Love's rod and staff comfort me. Love prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Love anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of love forever. Amen.
And may the seeking, embracing, and joyful Spirit of God be yours, both now and forevermore.